Hey guys, what's going on? It's Preston here from The Legendarium. Welcome to episode number three of the 30-minute author interviews. Here at The Legendarium, we're shining a light on indie publishing. Not only do we hope to interview your favorite author, but we hope you find a new favorite author through this podcast. This week, our guest is Paul Kohler. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy 30 Minutes with Paul Kohler. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Our guest today is Paul Kohler. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Paul. It's my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. You're one of the first um, one of the first indie authors that I really started um, getting into when I first got into indie publishing, so I'm excited to have you on here. Well, I appreciate it. Um, for those that don't know anything about you, um, why don't you give us a little uh, bio about yourself, tell them who you are, what you do, and everything like that. Right on. I'm uh, I'm Paul, and I've uh, been a closet writer for many years, um, going probably back to around the birth of my daughter. She uh, she's turning 19 in a few weeks, so that kind of gives you some timeline there. Um, you know, right after she was born, um, I kind of started to get the itch to to write. So I was going to you know just keep a journal, um, you know, just about how my life just instantly changed raising a daughter and um, I was journaling almost every day for a while there and then I started getting more creative with my with my writing and really kind of realized that um, you know stories and fiction really is really what I wanted to do and um, you know unfortunately it took me so many years to turn that into something that um, you know, 2013 was the first uh, publication that I did, and um, was a long time coming in between. So, what what's the first thing that you indie published? What's the first title that you put out there? It was a uh, linear shift part one, and uh, that went out uh, September 19th of 2013. Um, incidentally, the the very, very first thing I wrote back in 1998 was a little short story called Amy that actually published the next day or the a couple days after that in another anthology that I participated in. So it was nothing in, at all until September, you know, last part of September. Then my first, you know, personal short story went out, and then that um, uh, that first uh, part of Linear Shift was right there at the same time. So um, kind of jumped right in with both hands. And feet. What what was your inspiration for linear shift? You know, um, as with a lot of my stories, that you know, it came in a dream. The uh, there was something that happened in my dream that didn't actually happen in linear shift the book until um, he was um, back in 1942, San Francisco. There was a a, a, a scene where the main character. Uh, had a, a time travel experience to a parallel universe when he put something in a fireplace. Um, you've read the book. Um, I have. Um, and that was my dream. That that was that was the kernel of information that I had to work with. And from there, I had to extrapolate out, you know, the complete story that I wrote. And you know, I thought that the best place to do it was with obviously where I started. And you know, a guy down on his luck and widowed and you know unruly teenage kids and all that kind of stuff right um so you said you started writing when your daughter was born what was there a certain indie author or something that you read that pushed you going the indie route with uh publishing yeah um hugh howie uh, that that guy just gets everybody that <laughs> that, that he meets um, um i i had found an article online um it was probably uh March of 2013, and it was so inspiring because, you know, here's this guy, he's, you know, writing these books and he's self-publishing them and he's being successful at it, and it just so happened that he was going to be in Denver here for a book signing, and uh, like the next week, and I had not read any of his stuff at that point, um, so I read very quickly his book, Wool, and uh, then went to the book signing and, 
you know, he's, he's so inspiring in person and, and online. And he's just, a uh, his persona is incredible. And that pushed me to, you know, really kind of take it seriously and move forward with something as opposed to, you know, just dreaming about it. Yeah. It's kind of funny that, uh, cause like you said, Hugh has inspired so many people and he's the one that actually got me into reading indie publishing. I found his book wool, just like you did, but I found it in target. Um, I, I didn't read, uh, growing up. I didn't like reading, um, until I met who is now my wife and she, got me into reading the first thing she had me read was harry potter and then from then on i just i read and read and anytime we were in target or walmart or wherever if they had a book section i was going to find went to the going to the book section just to find what was there if anything caught my attention and i saw the cover of wool and picked it up and that's how i ended up getting into reading indie publishing even though wool is not the first indie story that i read um it's the one that i guess got me into Reader sure. Indy. Yeah. Did he say anything to you um, that at, at the signing that just really inspired you, or was it just the overall experience that inspired you? Know, you? Yeah, it was the overall experience. Um, you know, this was way before you know I had any you know aspirations of doing you know the self publishing thing. You know, if I you know I I think I might have said you know four or five words to the guy. You know, I'm not I wasn't starstruck, but you know by any means, but still, I mean I was. I'm I'm a kind of a shy person in you know in person, mm -hmm. um, and you know so I, it was tough to really you know come out and say things to him you know when I was there. But you know if things were different today and he came to Denver, oh I mean I'd I'd buy him a beer and then talk, probably talk his ear off. But um, <laughs> you know it was it was just the experience and and uh, you know just listening to how he did it and um, and so painless. I mean it was. Um, he made it sound so easy and it, and it is, it's hard. It's definitely hard. I mean, you know, probably the writing is the hardest part, but, um, you know, getting past the, uh, obscurity is probably the most difficult thing for all indie authors. And, you know, he's, he's proven that it's possible. So, right. Um, I was reading an interview you did online. I forget who it was with, and I didn't know this, um, cause I hadn't discovered you at the time, but you did a Kickstarter for the first part of linear shift and the second part. How, how did that, go and how was the overall experience with kickstarter you know i did do the kickstarter i mean there was um i kind of went back and forth on it um i had already paid jason Gurley for my my book cover and i already paid for gatewood to do my my editing on on part one and you know i've already put all the money out on my own and i was getting closer to it and i thought well i need to buy uh, you know, an ISBN number for the, you know, for the first book at least. And, you know, they're not really that cheap. Um, so then you, they, they offer the, the, these ISBNs in packs, you know, oh, you know, you can buy an individual one or you can buy a pack of 10 for, you know, a hundred and some dollars, $150. I don't remember what it was. And then you can buy a pack of a hundred for like 550 or something. I don't remember the exact numbers, but um, it's like, well, that's just, you know, so much more money than I wanted to spend. As I I thought, well, let's do this Kickstarter and just see if I can, you know, just get that 535 or, you know, you know, 550 bucks. And uh, I ended up getting um, a couple hundred dollars more than that uh, was much more successful than I thought it was going to be. And um, a number of the people that supported that first campaign, they said, well, why, why don't you do it again on your second one? And it's like, well, I don't need the money on the second one. And they said, well, use it to pay for your editing and pay for, you know, kind of reimburse you for some of your cover art that, that you already paid for. So I did, and it was also a success. And I, I, I asked for half of the money just because I didn't need that much. And I think they're great for, you know, people that are just starting off, but you get a lot of resistance though from you know the 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 donators because they you know why they they think why would I give this no name you know indie author any money he's not even proven and you know I think those are the people that need it the most you know the you know like the Hugh Howie he would you know he, he his income level is is substantial now that he doesn't need that but the people would be more willing to give him the money because he's proven right exactly so. So there's a there's a battle there that you know how do you convince the people that it's worth the risk you know it's a gamble it absolutely it's a gamble and um, you know I hope that what we put out is worthy enough that you know the gamble is a payoff but um, 
would, would you ever do Kickstarter again? You know, I'm actually contemplating doing Kickstarter again right now for both Linear Shift and The Borrowed Souls um, just to help support um, getting audiobooks put out for both of those. Um, I have an audiobook of part one of Borrowed Souls, which the uh, the narrator is phenomenal. He did a fantastic job on it. But he no longer does a, a, a royalty share for his uh, narrations. He is only, he only he works strictly um, by the finished hour, you know, at, at an hourly rate, and it's you know it's kind of substantial um, to to produce you know a book of that length. You know, it's going to cost me to pay him directly, you know, fifteen hundred to two grand. Wow. And. I don't have that, and I've had both of those up on um, Audible, you know, looking for auditions, and I'm getting zero responses to them because I'm only offering as a as a royalty share. These guys are they're saying, you know, they want to be paid for their time, which I I totally get, right. but um, it's, it's it's a big chunk of money to get an audiobook out. So Kickstarter might be an option, but again, I don't know. It's it's asking for a heck of a lot more money to. Um, you know, to make it through that. And Kickstarter only pays if 100% of the goal is met. So if I if I put a goal of $1,000 and I only get 900 in, it doesn't fund at all. So, right. uh, so I don't know. It's something I'm contemplating. Maybe after uh, things settle down with The Hunted Assassin, I'll, uh, I'll contemplate it. Because, you know, The Hunted Assassin, I want to get that into audio as well. I think it'll be even a much better story to be told by a, a professional narrator. Gotcha. When you, uh, I, I was able to go back on Kickstarter and look at the campaign that you did, and one of the rewards that you did was if people donated a certain dollar amount, they could help you name a character in the book. And you were doing three characters, I believe, with part one, or it was later on in the series. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, can you tell us which characters were were named by Kickstarter uh, people? Um, two of the three, um, those all, I, I put three of those out and it was a hundred dollars for each of those. And two of the three actually followed through with the characters. Um, the third one said, you know, he, he was just being generous and he didn't, you know, he didn't want to participate in, you know, helping create this character. Um, the characters were, um, they came in play, um, in part two and, um, I'm kind of going from memory here. One of them was the um, Peter's bodyguard. Um, um, <laughs> funny thing is, when I wrote the whole story, I hadn't, you know, used the the character creation yet because I was writing it just. I was putting in placeholders for the guy's name, and when I was writing it, his name was Bob, <laughs> and and so that's the only thing I could remember of, of the character was his name was Bob. And by the time I got to the end, I had to re go through the whole story and recreate his persona with this you know the character development and um, it was it was actually quite fun to do that so he now he has a name i think it was trevor i think is what i gave him a, his name but um then the other one was um uh epson's uh assistant he was the uh, the bad the bad guy and i had to create him all from all over from from the beginning as well um but it was a lot of fun and and I, i'd love to do that again i mean it was you know it gives people that you know, that was, it was a lot of fun for the two guys that did that. Um, and, you know, actually my father-in-law was one of them and he, he, he sent me you know, a couple pages of background on the guy and it was, it was a lot. <laughs> it, so I tried to include as much of all that information as possible. So, I mean, it made it a lot of fun for a lot of people. So that's funny. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about it. Why don't you tell people kind of, I guess, give them a brief overview of what linear shift is for those that don't know. Linear Shift is a story about a guy, uh, Peter Cooper, that is um, down on his luck. He's unemployed. He's in a house that's being foreclosed upon. His wife had passed away, and he's got kids. They're teenagers. They're kind of unruly, and his life is just falling apart. And he gets approached by um, a, 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 uh, a government guy from his past that – makes him an offer that he kind of can't refuse and it is to go back in time and change a minute little thing that should be able to alter the path of the of of society and he does go back after some training and uh without going too much with 
the story, I mean, that's part of reading it is, you know, finding out has things happen. Um, he makes it back to 1942 and is there, makes some changes, whether they were intended to or not, and then makes it back to, you know, present time, you know, for kind of a happy ending to the story, I guess. Yeah, well, one thing I liked about it when reading, uh, I believe it was, in, it was in part one and the guy was trying to convince him to go back, he, he said – it was to the effect of we've kind of run all the scenarios and we're pretty sure that your life, when you come back, there's a chance that will be, be uh, will be better than what you have now. And I was sitting here thinking, how would I even, how would I even answer that, that question? If someone came to me, there's a chance coming back, your life's going to be different. There's a chance it could be bad, but we're pretty sure it will be good. Right. <laughs> That's something I loved. Well, um, and you know, when you're down on your luck, like Peter was, I mean, you, he, you know, the uh, Applegate, I mean, that's the uh, General Applegate, that's the the military guy. He kind of had him by the short hairs. I mean, he had him between a rock and a hard place that he kind of knew that he would accept the mission. Um, you know, regardless of if, if the change, you know, when he when he'd come back from the mission was going to be good or potentially bad. I mean, he's already at the bottom. How much worse can it get for the guy? Exactly. And um you you published linear shift in uh, different parts. Was that your plan um, to publish it in, in different parts? Yeah, actually, I had initially um, six or seven parts kind of you know mapped out for that, and I was kind of following again Hugh Howey's approach to wool. I mean, he did part one through what one through five, I think, mm -hmm. and I was going to kind of do that same pr approach, you know, do kind of do a you know a part every month or every other month. And, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, on a personal side of things, um, my mom, she passed away the day that part one published. Mm -hmm. So it kind of took the little legs out underneath me. And I, I was, uh, I was unable to keep that pace like Hugh Howey did. And I think that probably hurt a lot of its momentum, um, you know, it took me, you know, almost a, a year to get all four parts out after that. So um, I ended up combining a couple of those, you know, in parts three and four were actually combined multiple parts that I had planned. One of your fans online, Jada Riker, she yep. says she loves linear shift. She wants to know if there will if we will see a companion to the series at some point or another series with the same characters. Yes, there is. Um, I'm kind of on the fence on how I'm going to take it. There's um, a couple avenues that I can take Peter, and um, they are two completely different directions, equally compelling. Um, I don't want to give too much away because I don't want to say one and then, then go the other way, and then right. you know, people are going to say, well, why did you go the other way instead? But the, yes, there is going to be um, almost, a, you know, kind of like an ongoing series kind of um, base that, you know, Peter, he might be just kind of a full-time time traveler that goes back, you know, for these, you know, um, contracted jobs to go, you know, make changes in history. Um, very alternate history type of uh, storytelling. And, you know, I have to kind of tread carefully because I don't want to, you know, completely rewrite how, you know, how society is, but um, uh, it, it could be a lot of fun doing that. Right. Yeah. I really enjoyed the first linear, the, the whole linear shift series. So uh, I'll, I'll definitely look forward to the next chapter in that series. You did a, uh, another novel in different parts. It was Borrowed Souls. Um, why don't you just give a, a brief summary of what Borrowed Souls is and what was the inspiration for that? Borrowed Souls also came to me in a dream. Um, the uh, the dream was, um, the, the nugget was the part when Jack Duffy killed himself. And um, that was the extent of my dream. It was just him sitting at this cafe and, and taking these pills to end his life. And... Um, I wrote part one as just kind of a short story. I wasn't going to, you know, necessarily take it much further than I did. I had some very small thoughts about how it could continue. Um, but the more I wrote it, the more I thought that it really could continue and develop into something really intriguing and kind of, kind of out there a little bit. And, um, 
it it did and it and it satisfied my writing whim like like nothing else um each book that i wrote had a different um a different set of characters but the same you know main character with jack duffy cuz as he kind of continued through his afterlife i guess and um and regrets of of suicide i mean that's uh, that's something that um you know was a main theme kind of through the whole the whole book right and that that one you released in different parts was that kind of the same with linear shift you just uh you decided to uh all along do it in parts and then release it as a f- complete novel at the end yeah and I, and i actually stuck to my plan on that one much better um i wrote part 1 you know when it was when it was just called borrowed souls um i did that in march of 2014 and then by the time I got back to it, I wanted to finish Linear Shift up first. Um, once it went out in April of 2015, I focused all of my efforts on writing um, the next um, six to eight parts of the Borrowed Soul story. And um, it got to about August when I had parts two and three written and edited, and I was working on parts four and five when I started started the publication process. Every three weeks I published a new part and I didn't miss a beat all the way through to the end. And I, in uh, December, I published December 31st, I published the entire novel um, as a complete story. And um, it was a lot of fun, you know, writing them in those individual parts. They were they were complete stories, but they were also part of the overall story. Yeah, I remember Borrowed Souls was the first book I read by you. I won it in a giveaway for a uh, in my I can't remember what it was for, but I won Borrowed Souls, um, the original cover you did for a giveaway. And I remember sending you a message when I got done saying something to the effect of, "Please tell me you're going to continue the story. If not, can I? Because." <laughs> I, I wanted it conti- to continue. It was such a cool story. Um, and then you told me that you did plan on releasing more. So um, for those that haven't read it, I highly recommend the book, uh, the, the whole series. It's, it, it's a great, great story. Right. And incidentally, that is also queued up for um, a continuation, um, an ongoing series that uh, I have two different directions. I might want to take that one as well. And uh, Penelope, um, Penny, who's uh, comes in and you know close to the end of the story, um, may or may not have uh, a focus on the on the continuation of this, um, but it's very possible that that some really cool things can happen in that. Just when I write these I, these sequels, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I guess that brings us uh, kind of uh, with what you're launching right now and what has you busy. You're releasing the Hunted Assassin. Um, you originally decided to do this in Kindle Scout. Can you tell people what Kindle Scout is and why you decided to try to do this through Kindle Scout and uh, I guess where we're at today with it and your whole Kindle Scout process? Yeah, yeah. Um, Kindle Scout was a um, – it, it's uh, Amazon offers this program for indie authors that I guess uh, traditional can apply for this as well, but they um, – they try to get the cream of the crop, the best of the best of these stories, and you submit this story that you that you slave over, you know, for months and months, uh, and it sits out there for the public eye to read the first uh, 5,000 words of the story, and based off of that and the, you know the story synopsis and the book cover, they vote or they nominate it for publication. And this goes on for 30 days. It's really kind of a glorified popularity contest. Um, And in the end, it really comes down to the decision of the, you know, the editors or the acquisition editors for uh, Kindle Press, whether they offer a contract or not. And the contract is, you know, kind of similar to, you know, how self-publishing is going is, um, it's a royalty split, um, and you give rights away for five years that's you know, renewable based on you know income tiers or how much the book's earning. Um, 
if it doesn't earn out, um, you you know the re the rights revert back to you, and then you you can do what you want with it. But um, it would been a great start for any author because it kind of gives you a little bit of horsepower behind the you know the marketing side of things. I think that's where the the benefit of of the Kindle Scout program is is it, they're going to stand behind it and they're going to help uh, market you and your book. And um, the royalty share is less that way than it would be if you know if I'm self publishing by myself. Um, that's the that was the reason why I wanted the Kindle Scout was just because I wanted a little bit of assistance on the marketing because I, I marketing is not my strong point I, I i try to share my you know my 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 books with people on facebook and the twitter and uh, any anywhere else online i can find and it's it, it's i hate it i despise it i would rather be focusing my time writing books and stories and and letting myself be creative there is no creativity in marketing <laughs> right yeah that that's one thing i'm hearing from uh the authors I've interviewed so far is marketing is one of the things that they just don't, don't really care for. Yeah. It's tough. I, I don't like it, but I, the reward of, you know, being satisfied of the complete story and reading a really glowing review, you know, makes it all worth it you yeah. know, in the end. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's just kind of an evil necessity that we all have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, Kindle Scout, it's, it's great if you get accepted. Unfortunately, uh, my story did not get accepted, and um, but, you know, so I'm going self-publishing it, which was the plan, you know, from the very beginning. That if it if it didn't go, which um, I'm not arrogant enough to think that I was going to get accepted, I had my fingers crossed. But um, in the end, I'm you know I'm going it alone, and you know it's going to be a great story. It's uh, very much very different from the other uh, two novels that I've written. That it's much more action-packed. Um, there's just so much going on in this book, and it's actually a smaller book than the other two books as well. So mm -hmm. uh, either I'm getting better at my at my prose, or um, it just it just seems tighter. That you know the 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 whole the whole book does seem much tighter. So gotcha. And can you kind of give us an overview of what the hunted assassin is about? Sure. Um, there's a guy, his name's Jackson Rasner. He is a, he's an ex-covert agent for the Global Security Agency. It's a futuristic story, and he, um, he was hiding. He was, he had, he had faked his own death to, to kind of get away from it because he was, you know, kind of, you know, the GSAs, that he was there, you know, kind of a little personal mercenary to go out and, you know, kill dignitaries or, or whatever. That's what his job was, was to, was to be a killer. And he was done with it. He didn't want to be that, that person. So he was hiding out on a space station in, uh, called Tulu Station when um, they, they started coming after him. There was uh, assassins to go kill the assassin. And that theme kind of carried on through most of the story. Um, and there's a reason behind it, and I'm not going to give away the farm quite yet. Right. Uh, so um, he um, he kind of gets um, brought back into the fold, and you know there's a crisis that needs to be solved, and it needs his you know expertise, and you know all along his daughter is missing, and he's a strange daughter. He hasn't he's never met her. He knows of her, and and all that, but he had uh, he made that decision to remove himself from her from her life early on because of what he did so so now he's you know he's flying around space trying to solve the world's problems as well as you know try to find his daughter who did the cover because it's a it's a very gorgeous cover i i did the cover did you i really? uh, yeah i i've, I've I paid Jason Gurley to do my first covers for Linear Shift, parts one, two, three, and four. And I've done all my other covers myself. And, you know, I'm, I'm a creative person. I've got creative juices flowing in all, you know, all orifices that um, I'm an architect by day. Um, so I'm very graphic, you know, oriented. So it, it, it just kind of comes to me on those types of things. And um, I probably spend way more time on those book covers than I I should be writing, but, um, you know, when you're indie, I mean, you kind of try to cut your corners cost wise and, 
if I was putting ugly covers out there, clearly I would have been doing a different thing. But um, they, they come out pretty nice, so I, I keep doing it. Yeah, well, it, it turned out great. Um, we'll, we'll put a link down below in the show notes um, for The Hunted Assassin. It uh, was just uh, released the other week on June 28th. So uh, I'll put a link down there for everybody to go check it out. Um, hopefully they will after the interview is done. It, and, it's on special right now as well. I think for, um, what did I say, 48 hours, I'm going to keep it at 99 cents, and then it goes back up again to, to three ninety nine. Sounds good. So there you go, everybody. Um, make sure you go, as soon as you're done with the interview, over to Amazon and check out The Hunted Assassin. Um, and as I did, as, as you probably know, you, you were uh, one of the authors I interviewed with my 10 questions with. I plan on ending my podcast with kind of some not-so-serious questions. Um so we're now just going to jump into the legendary ending. And the first question is, what songs are currently on your writing playlist? I, 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 I have music on every time I write. Um, it has to have no words. I don't really have a playlist. I have actually a classical radio station that... Um, that I stream from online. Uh, I think it's on Amazon Prime or something like that. But it's just instrumental uh, strings and maybe piano, but guitar a lot of. No words. It, it, I'm a very big fan of music, and um, my, my my range of music is vast. Um, I, I actually like rap, hip hop, rock, maybe a little bit of country, but more classic rock than anything. And if something's playing on the radio while I'm writing, I'm more listening to the music and trying to sing along and then I'm screwed. I, I, I just can't. I just can't. So I, I've changed that path. And um, when I'm editing, usually ZZ Top is playing. But when I'm, when I'm actually writing, it's, it's tough without um, some, you know, ambient noise more than anything else right gotcha so so if you were listening to classic rock while writing while you're writing we might end up having song lyrics as a story instead oh yeah Z, yeah zz top is, is one of my favorites and you know they uh they they actually are on I, I have all of their albums burned to my computer so it just plays and i've got big speakers in my office here and it, it it's actually a lot of fun but uh, I, I can't do it with writing. No, it, it just wouldn't work. That's funny. <laughs> I'd be naming characters based off, you know, Diablo or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. If you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse with one of your book characters, which one would you want to be stuck with and why? Oh, I'm going with, uh, you know, the, the latest book, Jackson Rasner. Um, he's kind of a badass. He, you know, he's been a killer for so many years that, you know, he knows how to survive and uh, he knows how to hide out fairly well and um, i think he would be the great guy to do that um i'd stand behind him sounds good now if you could pick any character from any media source movies comics television whatever who would you pick and why oh um i'm uh, i'm not a big fan of you know all of the uh you know the superheroes and you know the comic book you know I think they're really kind of overdoing it. It seems like every new movie that comes out is like that. So I don't, I don't follow it enough to really say yes to one of those. Maybe Superman, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Buffy, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mean, I, I remember watching that show um, when it was out, and my wife and I both loved it. And, um, you know, now my daughter, she's, uh, she was very reluctant to watch it. Um, she loves it now. Buffy, she she kicks ass. I mean, she'd uh, she'd take care of it, and um, you know, that there's that. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you had a time machine, where would you travel, and why? Um, you know, my, I already went back into the past with my book, so I don't think I need to do that. Um, I'd kind of want to see how things turn out. Um, I'm not the guy that goes and looks at the last page of a, of a book that I'm reading, um, but I certainly would like to, on a personal reason, to just see that you know we're doing the right things in life. You know, are we really killing the planet? You know, by um, greenhouse gases or all this stuff. You know, maybe 50 years into the future, um, just to see if you know if uh, if things we could be if I could do something different today. I know that's kind of a probably a, a lame answer, but you know, I, I kind of like to see how things are going. No, I think that's a good answer. I think you're the first person to actually want to go into the future. Everybody else has gone into the past so far. Yeah. Um, if you could write under a pen name, what genre would you write and why? 
Well, funny thing is I'm actually researching um, cozy mysteries. Um, it's probably a year down the road before I get there, but right now I am reading through a bunch of various authors and cozy mysteries, and I have um, I have a pen name in in in, in mind, and that's uh, going to be the genre. It's going to be cozy mysteries, um, kind of a fun. They're short, um, kind of quirky, um, lighthearted. You know, nothing too too drastic. Gotcha. And if you had to pick one genre to read for the rest of your life, which would you choose and why? Wow. One genre for the rest of my life. It's got to be science fiction. I, I, I love science fiction. And I, I would love to actually just write science fiction, but I, I am not sciency enough to really pull it off right. So, I mean, it's a lot of research on my end, but reading it, oh, I, I, I could suck it up, man. I, I love that stuff. Gotcha. Um, and now for the famous question that the Legendarium is known for. A penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and why is he here? Well, I, I, I'm not sure what he's saying. I, I don't speak penguinese fluently, um, but the sombrero kind of gives it off. I, I, you know, I think he might be looking for his lost horse. That's, you know, <laughs> that's the only thing I got. Gotcha. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, before we leave, do you have any advice um, – whether it be for writing or for life that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, you know, I do. I think if, um, don't dream it, do it. Um, I, I spent so many of my life, so many years of my life dreaming about writing and publishing and, and, you know, once it's done, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally possible. It just as everything else in life is, I mean, don't just think about dreaming about doing something, actually go and do it. Um, I think it it applies to so many different things in life. Gotcha. That's good advice. Um, where can our listeners go if they want to find out more about you and uh, your books and stories that you write? Uh, I have a website. It's paulkohler.net. Um, there's it's a blog. It's a website. You can buy signed books there. Um, links to my Amazon page. Um, otherwise, the Amazon author page. Um, which I think I can give you and put it in, in your in your uh, in your links below. Um, that's probably the best place because it it links actually to all of the books that I have available as well as um, to my blog. Sounds good. Well, uh, thank you for joining us uh, today and telling us um, a little bit about your new book, The Hunted Assassin. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. Well, guys, that's our time for this episode. Thank you for joining us for the 30-minute author interviews. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and please leave a review. It really helps out. And until next time, guys, stay legendary. Oh, screwed that one up. Blooper reel.